Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of our podcast, Beneath Your Skin. This is uh, somehow a special episode because uh, we are going to talk about uh, a movie that is still in theater. It only came out uh, four days ago. It was the first movie I finally watched in theaters after more than one year and a half. So, yeah, it's a special episode. It, it has a lot of special elements in it. First of all, Zoe and I don't agree on this movie. <laughs> I am such a funger for this movie. You never hear me being so fangirling in an episode of this podcast, like I'm going to be for this one movie. And uh, it's special, as I said, because uh, this movie uh, should have been in theaters last year. But you know all what happened. I mean, COVID and uh, lockdowns and uh, all that jazz that we know everything about and we don't want to talk about anymore. As I said, I am fangirling about this movie because I totally adore the two main actors. I think the chemistry between them is one of the best chemistry I have ever seen on screen. The only two people who are more perfect together than those two are Marcus and Tomas in the Exorcist TV show. Give me Mulder and Scully any day. Mulder and Scully would have done a way better job. <laughs> no, I don't agree. I don't agree. I adore Mulder and Scully, but for me, Hannibal and Will have more chemistry on screen than uh, Mulder and Scully. So, no, <laughs> I don't agree. And this is just the beginning, people. Let's <laughs> just count how many times me and Zoe will disagree on this movie. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a ride. <laughs> so I think uh, we should say what movie oh, we are yes. talking about. Yeah. <laughs> My help. So we we watched the third movie of the Conjuring franchise. And I will let Zoe open the episode <laughs> now because I want to hear her. <laughs> So the film is The Devil Made Me Do It, which I think is the only reason I saw the film. I saw the film because the devil made me do it. I didn't do it by choice. Like, the devil is me. Yeah, exactly. The devil is me. I only <laughs> went to see this because you told me, oh, it's out and it's good. And I went to see it and it was out and it wasn't good. And I was like, me and Gaia are going to have words because the Gaia made me do it. And the Gaia was wrong. <laughs> That would that could be the title of the fourth movie Gang. of the saga. <laughs> Gaia made me do it. Um, I am not a romantic. I barely have any shape sh shape ships. I barely have any straight ships. Like all all my relationships are very queer or completely slash or completely in the realms of like yaoi and anime fandom, with the exception of Mulder and Scully. And obviously, like, Lucifer and Decker. Those are, I think, the only two, like, straight pairings that I'm really, like, yay about. And Mulder and Scully are, like, my pinnacle of, like, you know, I love them. But then The X-Files is the greatest TV show ever made. And I firmly believe that if, you know, Dave and Lorraine Warren had watched an episode of X-Files, they might have actually done something in this that was, that was good. Oh, I don't, I don't care about their romance. I really don't. They are good actors. They are a lovely couple. But I don't care. Because I'm not romantic. And this film heavily relies on you caring about them and their journey and their pain and their relationship and their love. And I'm sorry, love doesn't save the day. Do you know what does save the day? Research being prepared, knowing your craft, knowing your area of expertise and knowing what you are facing. Study and research and hard work. Not, but it's me. You can't hurt me. You love me. And I'm like, oh, shut up. Like, you know, you went into that situation ill prepared. OK, so let's start. This is a very famous case. 
the devil made me do it. So, like, it's a real case that happened in America of the guy going into court and saying, like, don't, like, give me the death sentence. It wasn't my fault I committed murder. The devil made me do it. Now, the positioning of history of this case is quite interesting because by this point in, like, American history, the satanic panic had already happened. We'd already had Manson and Helter Skelter, and we'd already had the massive, massive, and I know more about this, because instead of watching this movie, go and watch the docudrama Sons of Sam, because um, which is like the Son of Sam killer, which even though I have my own take on the obsessive nature of the detective and how much about a cult this is, it gives you an interesting look at the satanic panic that happened in America. And this film is after the satanic panic, which means like, it just like, I'm like, historically, like Americans at large would have gone through all of that media consumption and it would have gone through the son of Sam and all those interviews about how like, oh, I was talking to the devil and we were in a cult and the, all these cults like and the secret societies of America and that massive, massive conspiracy about loads of rich and famous people being in a satanic cult and therefore getting away with what they'd done. And I wish I hadn't have known all this stuff going into this movie because I'm going, OK, there's the cult of the ram. Ooh, this is going to be interesting. No, they were all got arrested. Now there's no cult. I'm like, okay, thanks for that. Okay, right, the trailer makes it sound... He's going to claim the devil made him do it. Ed and Lorraine are going to have to prove in court the existence of demons, or at least the existence of how demonic influence and being so immersed in that culture and so immersed by cult ideology it could make you believe that and therefore he would not be in his right mind but crossed with but it also could be full demonic possession they were in court for like 10 minutes i'm like this is i thought it was going to be a courtroom drama i thought this was going to be the exorcism of emily rose meets the exorcist three and i'm like wow won't that be interesting no no, they were like, we're going to court. OK, prove it. Now we are going to, instead of going to court and proving any of this, we are going to rip off pretty much every exorcist film by having, ha ha, I am going to stand in front of a house with a hat and a briefcase in the streetlight. I'm like, sod off. You're not the exorcist. Don't do that. Oh, no, I'm like in prison and you don't know if I'm possessed or not. No, the exorcist already did that. Oh no, I'm coming off the bed. Oh, the wind, and the blue lighting and the wonderful camera work, which is good camera work. I've got to give it. And the reaching. I'm like, exorcist already did that. Stop being the exorcist. Stop it. Like, can we go back to like the original haunting in the house stuff? Like the first 10 minutes of the movie before the credits, I was like, this is setting it up. Oh, now they're going to do flashbacks to how it all went down. No, 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 they didn't do any of that. I'm like, everything I wanted from this movie and everything I expected, they didn't do. Instead, I got an hour of the most boring episode of X-Files you could ever imagine. They're like, let's go over here and talk to this person. Let's have some exposition. Let's go over here and talk to this person. Let's have some exposition. Now I'm in a field. Now I'm by a lake. Now I'm in John Noble's house. Why? Who cares? We'll tell you later. Now someone's stabbing someone. Why? Who cares? We'll tell you later. Oh, look, let's all do investigations in the dark. It's the 80s. Houses have lights. Why don't you turn your main light on? It's the freaking middle of the night and you've got all your papers and you're sitting there with just desk lamps and candles going, ooh. It's like, no, turn your light on. Look at the papers and see what you've got. Just, oh, oh, guy, I could rant for hours about all the things that I was just like, no, no. You are also meant to be the premium paranormal investigators who know about this stuff. Why would you go into a satanic tunnel with not a single bit of preparation? Also, like by the time like stuff was going on, I'm like, oh, so it's witches now. It's not a cult. It's a witch. Well, I'm sorry, but 
witchcraft and cults are different. Yes, they've got some overlap in their beliefs, but this is not a cult. This is a witch who was obsessed with the cult. And it's like, why did you just tell us that? And also, the most stereotypical witch ever. It's like, if you saw that woman walking down the road, you'd be like, oh, look at that really gaunt, like, dead-eyed woman in a black dress with a white frit. She's clearly a witch. And you're like... Oh, so stereotypical, like, witch stuff. And I'm like, clearly there's going to be a hex bag in your house. Why are you not checking for hex bags? You've just admitted that there's a connection between you. Check for hex bags. Oh, no, I'm nearly dying. Oh, was there a hex bag in the pot? Well, I could have told you that about ten minutes ago if you'd just listened to me. And it was just like, also, I solved the case without proving the existence of demons. Me and my husband solved the case. So the guy says the devil made him do it. And he goes to prison and they have to prove the existence of demons. Or how about you go to like the trial and go, right, you were ill. You clearly had the cold or the flu or something. You were very ill. Um... You had just dropped a chainsaw because you were ill and that caused an accident that made you feel really heightened and on edge, a little bit traumatised, going, oh, that was really unlike me, that could have caused trauma, I'm a little bit sensitive, I'm a little bit like, you know what, I need to go home and sleep. I've probably taken paracetamol or cold and flu or whatever medication was around at the time, so there's, there's some drugs in my system. Oh, like, my landlord is absolutely bat shit and wants to try really loud music that's probably giving me a massive migraine and probably putting my senses out of whack because I've clearly got the flu and some trauma. Oh, he's going to force me to drink beer on top of my medication, my migraine, my trauma, like, like his senses are like, the dude's probably going to have a seizure or something. He probably does have a seizure. And when he comes to, he stabbed the dude that is chasing him around the house with loud music, trying to force him to drink and dance. When all he wants to do is go lie down in the dark. You forget that we are in America. Yes. They can't, they can't use mental illness or even temporary mental illness when people are really mentally ill and... Uh, no, my landlord wanted me to drink beer and I already took drugs. It's not going to work in a court. That's the easy way to put you on a on a death row. Yeah. So yeah. But it's a, so, but it uh, would have made more sense that way. And then I thought, okay, fine. Let's go with you being hexed by a witch. Well, how about she has been using the power of suggestion? hypnosis like feeding you thoughts and fears and having a psychological attack on you to the point where you believe what's going on and therefore psychologically you think the devil made you do it rather than go straight to let's prove and they never even proved that the demon existed in fact they, we never even really saw the demon it was just a crazy witch lady and i'm sorry but the church would have known that all those insanely religious items are there they're not just going to bury it in a tunnel and go we'll pretend that never happened there would have been a catalogue of like okay all this really culty demonic witchy ex like church paraphernalia is down there they wouldn't have just gone Don't. hey john noble you just sit on a house Don't. and look after that no. stuff no 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 that's that's your mistake <laughs> no 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 uh the priest uh, who was following the case uh, left the church yeah the church, in that case, would have done everything in its power to cover, okay. to forget he even existed. So he kept his uh, ritualistic paraphernalia, and the church never saw that because the church wasn't interested in seeing them. Okay, I still because want to know how she they... got it down a tunnel. That was a massive altar to get down by yourself, plus all those statues. I'm like, how did you get them down the tunnel, woman? Like how? Okay, the okay, the statue weren't in the tunnel; they were in the in the ceiling. Okay. Because from the ceiling you go to the tunnels where the altar was. I still don't know how she put the altar there, okay. but the the statues they were in the ceiling. They were everything his father uh, collected in his life and put in the in the basement, yeah. not the ceiling, the basement. Yes. So yeah. I'm gonna so, take a breath and uh, let you talk. <laughs> for I, 10 minutes. Uh, I can I can uh give you something 
and I totally disagree with uh, most of what you said, but I can give you this could have worked as a, an X Files case. Yeah, that it could have worked like that. I don't agree with you not appreciating the the homage that the first scene was to the Exorcist, because who better than the Warrens could have represented such an homage to the most perfect horror movie in history. The, the director, he knew, he knew what he was doing and he did it well. He did it well in the beginning, he did it well. I think uh, one of the reasons why you are so unhappy with this movie is because uh, the last missing scene of this movie. This movie was not created to be the conclusion of a trilogy but another episode uh, done to introduce a new enemy for the Warren. Uh, he decided at the end not to put the ending scene in the, in the movie because probably the studios told him they weren't interested in making another Conjuring movie. Uh, he still has hope he will, but uh, there is nothing sure. So um, I think uh, one of the reasons why you didn't like this is because uh, basically we are missing some information because for what I know, this movie was supposed to introduce the real cult. Right, okay. She, w she wasn't the main focus. She wasn't the main villain. She was just someone who used to distract the Warrens from what was really happening. Yeah, because that's the story I wanted. I wanted the cult, the especially this big cult that, like, after doing Son of Sam... And... It was out there. It was out there. She was only meant to distract the Warrens while they were doing whatever cult is doing in his everyday life, ruining lives, selling souls, killing people. Yeah, you know, same old stuff. Because the stakes didn't feel high enough in this. The ending seemed anticlimactic. I felt like I was watching them to go investigate something Be and then it just because, fizzled. Because it wasn't the end. It wasn't supposed to be the end. And by the director's words... We already saw in this movie who was supposed to be the real villain and the real enemy. So I have a feeling the whole trial was just uh, for sure. Because I have a feeling the, the lawyer, they are able to convince uh, at dinner, at the dinner we didn't see, is in truth uh, part of the cult. Yes, and that would be in line with the actual history of just coming out of the satanic panic. And I can't remember the name of the cult that was like influencing like big decisions and like trials and stuff. And whether or not you fully believe it or not is up to you, but it's an interesting story. But it, this movie was supposed to be something else. I still enjoyed it greatly, a lot more than the second one, because I still can't believe they made uh, the crooked man coming out from a dog. Yes, and all that Valaric so. rubbish. I'm like, just do oh. the original Enfield haunting, because that's yeah. a good story. But they made yeah, it to American. Indeed. I will give uh, a yeah. bonus for this movie. They did not CGI loads of shit. I really appreciate them grounding it in reality and making it more subtle and clever. I do think any of the contortion stuff that the characters do in this is brilliant. Like those, the contortion and the moving around. And, and the sound. Yes, the sound the design sound. is great. The editing, the sound editing, the sound editor. They have been amazing because the way the bodies move in sync with these uh, very creepy bones cracking sounds, perfect, absolutely perfect. And uh, the child, 
the child was good. Yes. He was the first child I didn't hate at first sight. So that's something. That's something. And I like how, in the end, uh, he's the one telling us some very important information, sharing with us that what it is to have someone else in your head telling you to art yourself. Yeah. Because this is what the demon wanted to do, because he was promised the soul. The demon was forced to prey on these people because someone else was behind its summoning. So it's good to know, to, to hear from someone who really knows what it feels like, what is going on in uh, Harney's yeah. um, mind right now. Because sometimes uh, what happens is uh, that uh, you go through something horrific and uh, People who never went through the same path are like, oh, I, I understand your pain. No, you don't. No, you don't. Not even close. The child, David, he understood because he went through the same. So finally, something that really was real and, and pathetic, empathic, and pathetic, what's the word? Real and tangible, I would go with. No, uh, oh, tangible. Okay, but yeah, but no, I do. I liked the line when he when he when the David was saying that like it's like there's someone always there with you whether you want them or not, getting closer. And it was like that. That's it's, that's a lovely, a lovely bit. What I really appreciated in this movie is that we got um, a glimpse of uh, what Lorraine's life was. She helped the police in more than one case. Many times uh, the police uh, went to her. When they were desperate, uh, when they didn't have uh, anywhere else uh, to look, they went to her. And uh, one of the most famous cases she solved basically alone uh, was the rape and murder of a young woman who was uh, uh, assaulted uh, in the gas station where she worked. And uh, she was taken by three men, raped and killed, and then thrown away in a, in a place where they were building something. There were no, uh, no clues on who could have done such a terrible thing. There was... Uh, no proof left behind. And so the after months from this terrible case that shocked the small town where it happened, the police decided, you know what, we have nothing to lose. And one of them went to, to Lorraine. And uh, first she asked him to take her on the various places. And yes, she uh, corrected him, like we see in the movie. You missed the, the exit. It's behind that corner that you found the body. Then nothing happened, and it, it looked like uh, uh, she couldn't get any sign or whatever. And then she went back home, and she dreamed of this girl and uh, the last moments of her life. So she called the policeman and he asked her, between your suspects, is there someone with this tattoo on his forearm and blah, 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 blah. And then it came out that the three men she indicated like the, the murders, the rapists and murders of this girl were indeed the ones who killed her. So it was good to see beyond the skeptic glazes that she gets of course but that's normal i mean someone with uh, a gift that is impossible to explain uh, will always meet skeptics in her life but then she showed them wrong she proved them wrong and i don't agree i mean i don't like uh, uh, romances uh, in general you know me i don't have uh, i only have one uh, Heathrow ship. 
and it's not something I want to, to talk about because, uh, you know, with the madness going on uh, yes. uh, through, um, through fandoms, uh, uh, the, the kindest thing people could tell me would be that I have problematic. Yes. <laughs> we talk about the problematic thing. Yeah. So I only have one hetero um, ship, but those two, those two, do something to me and what really like what i really like is the chemistry between them they work so good together they are perfect they are the warrants they are not playing the warrants they become the warrants during the three movies of the conjuring franchise and even at the end of hannibal comes home the only interesting part of the whole movie are the five minutes with the warrants. So, I mean, yeah, a uh, good solid couple. I don't. I mean, yeah. I, I don't dislike them. I just, mm -hmm. I'm just not very good on the whole. Like, love saves the day as a plot line, because uh, the problem is that both of them are so deeply religious, and both of them really know and believes. Uh, their gifts come from God, and God is uh, never handing love. God is the Almighty love. So, yes, it works. It works for them that love saves the day because their gifts come from the brightest example of pure love. Oh, yeah, I'll accept it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I have to. To, tell, to share this with you people because it was fun. I took a very dear friend of mine to watch this movie with me. She's terrified of horror movies. Totally. She watched the first Conjuring with me and she didn't sleep for one week. <laughs> and at some point uh, she was uh, basically hiding behind my shoulder even if uh, i have to admit i can admit uh, this wasn't scary this wasn't oh, a God, scary no. movie. No so chance. she was she was still hiding behind my shoulder and zoe knows me uh, i'm not big at all so she was still managing to hide behind my my shoulder for most of the movie and at some point, uh, towards the end, I I look at her because she was too quiet and I, I was like, oh my God, did I kill her? And then I looked at her and she was crying. And I was like, oh my God, Julia, what happened to you? <laughs> oh my God, so romantic. <laughs> I, I love them. <laughs> and I was like, Julia, this is not exactly the reaction I was expecting <laughs> to an horror movie. <laughs> But yes, people, the the last scene with him building the gazebo in the garden for Lorreen, that was what got my friend. She was crying like a cut down tree. And she was like, oh my God, so romantic, I love them. And Julia, Julia, do you know, right, we watched an horror movie and not a romance? <laughs> She's not sure. <laughs> She's still not so sure I was right. So <laughs> Here, here's my confession. So when they revealed the gazebo and they're going, oh, you built it for me. I was like, why are they looking at a gazebo? And obviously my poor husband had to explain to me. He's like, remember their first date? They kissed in the rain under a gazebo. Oh, I didn't get that. I didn't get the connection at all. I'm like the most unromantic person in the world. I didn't oh, realize. God, I didn't know. Oh, I didn't... come on. I mean, that, that, was, <laughs> that was a phone call. Come on. I didn't it get was it. Like, okay, but, but it was like, okay, people, look at this gazebo. Look really well, really good at this gazebo because we are going to put it somewhere near the end of the movie. I... And at the end of the movie, they were like, hey, do you remember the gazebo? Here it is. <laughs> no, I, I didn't know. I didn't realize I'd been kissing under a gazebo. It was just, I just thought it was like, I don't know, there was some wood and there was some lights and there was rain. 
<laughs> and I then just... suddenly the rain stopped because they were under the gazebo. <laughs> I didn't notice. <laughs> so at the end of the gazebo was revealed. I was like, well, that's a nice gazebo, but why is this such a special moment? I'm, I feel like I'm missing something here. So after we got out of the cinema, I was like, Luke, why was there a gazebo? What? And he was like, you know, the one they were kissing in? When were they kissing in a gazebo? I missed it completely. Didn't get it. Didn't. Didn't get it. Oh, God. People, next time you should come with me, Zoe and Julia to watch a movie because it will be hilarious to see what Zoe will miss and Julia will get and I will be in the middle trying to keep both of them quiet because honestly it will be hell <laughs> one sure sobbing at the beautiful romantic gesture and the other one going I don't get the gesture <laughs> what what's happening and the, one in, and the one in the middle will be more or less like this Oh, who are you again? <laughs> oh, I am stuck between two people I don't know. Oh, one is crying, one is throwing up. But yeah, I don't know them. And then I will go away alone and I will be able like I don't know them at all. So yeah, people, oh, yeah. Oh. Mm -mm, stay tuned for the day. Gaia, Zoe, and Julia will go to the theater together. <laughs> a romantic, a completely opposite end of the romance, and, and just a regular human in the middle going, What is with you people? <laughs> oh, it was just, it was really embarrassing. I didn't get it. And I was like, I've, I've clearly missed something. Was I? Like, and yeah, oh well. But then I feel like that my problem with this movie is I tried to go in with no expectations. You said it was good. So I was like, it's going to be all right. As long as it's better than any of the fucking Lorona's and nuns and Annabelle's. And it is better. It is better than all of them. I think the trailer should not have had so much focus on the court because I really wanted to see the two of them, all their knowledge, all their history, all their like just their insight and their career on trial and especially since i love courtroom dramas I've, I've watched so many of them and it's just like you know including things like you know was it 12 angry men which is literally 12 men in a room for an hour and a half discussing a case and it's a brilliant the original the original not not the remake it's a brilliant bit of courtroom drama did they make a remake i think they did yeah I remember seeing oh, it. Oh God, going, no! No, exactly. Oh, like, no, 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 no. Just no. Doesn't matter who you put in it. It's not the original. So I was really, and also because I'd literally been watching documentaries on Helter Skelter and some new ones set up on Netflix. I'd been like thinking about the Satanic Panic, and I think that in my mind I was just like, this movie would have been the perfect vehicle to have Ed and Lorraine fight to prove their career and their beliefs in a public space and go up against this cult conspiracy that may or may not be real but they could have played it like it was real and this this the satanic panic and the cult that was there during the son of sam is a really interesting case and it was and then it was just like it was none of those things and it was just a long episode of X-Files. And that's not a terrible thing because I love X-Files and I like a drama, but because I'm not as emotionally attached to Ed and Lorraine, like they're good characters, they're good actors. I'm just not a fangirl of it. I'm not like, I don't buy into the romanticism of it. I wanted to see the, the grunt work. I wanted to see how they proved this case. And instead I got something else and then a massive meandering detour with John Noble and his daughter when they could have, some of that could have been done earlier or, and, and then so much focus on a character that was a witch essentially. And I'm like, but that's not any of the setup. There's something more at play here. And I feel like you're not telling me something and something's been cut out of this film. And now it's, it felt disjointed. It went from a court case, a really cool, interesting demonic possession case, a really interesting court case, a meandering investigation into stuff that I don't 
doesn't a hundred percent relate to the really interesting stuff, and then a fizzle, and you're like, this film was not well put together. Probably because the big interesting thing got scooped out by producers knowing them, and I'm like. No, this is the third film in what I thought was a trilogy, which should have been the final act of this power couple to prove their life's work on the main stage while also dealing with a demonic possession because that's what they do. And you didn't get any of it. And I was like, oh. I Can I tell you something, Zoe? Yeah. Can I tell you something, Zoe? You went into this movie with a lot of expectations. And you don't even know that. No, I think I realized that. You went into this movie with a lot of expectation and you wanted the movie to be the one you had in your mind. Yeah. That's why you didn't enjoy it. The more I talk for because it, the more you I realized already, I had a film you in my head. Had a mo- exactly. You already had the movie in your, in your head and you had a lot of expectations. So... And I'm sorry, but... Uh, you never watch the you... trailers of horror films because sometimes exactly. they lie to you. Oh, well, well, okay. Mm. Never mm. watch the, the trailer of an horror movie and then we end up with Sam Maud. Oh, oh God, people, <laughs> yeah. I went into that without the trailer and then I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. we, we went through movies that didn't even get the title right. <laughs> yes. I have two on top of my head. For example, Killer Sofa. <laughs> it was a recliner. Yeah. And then Annabelle comes home. She was already there. Yeah, exactly. She was in the basement. She was there. So, okay. yeah. so we watched movies who didn't even, that didn't even get the title right. Yeah. So, this yeah. one had the title right because, yeah. And also, I got to admit, the ending credits when they do the side by side reality in the movie stills and they show the actual recording. Fascinating the sequence is brilliant. And that little interview snippet of the guy going like, well, what's the precedence for like law now if anyone can go into the court and say the devil made me do it? And I wish they had included a reenactment of that scene, that interview in the movie because everything I wanted from that film was summed up in what a minute of ending credits and I'm just like oh why was this film not the film it should have been and that's probably why I didn't like it so much because it was just a really long boring case people I can tell you Zoe and I are still friends even if (laughs) we didn't agree with this movie it's not the first time and uh, I think it makes the episode more interesting somehow because finally we are not seeing the very same things (laughs) why did we watch this we're so sorry we'll never get our lives back (laughs) exactly so uh if Zoe doesn't have anything else to say no no i don't (laughs) thank you for listening and uh, let us know on what side you are are you on Team Gaia enjoying this movie or are you on Team Zoe hating it because you had too many expectations? That's not the only reason you... I hated it. It does have some, <laughs> like, you know, slow storytelling, meandering plot. You already had the movie made in your mind. Admit it. So you, <clears throat> there was no way you could have enjoyed anything different from the movie you had in your mind. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, we are still friends and we are still going to, to watch very terrible movies for you people. Let us know. We have a, a Facebook page. Go and look for Beneath Your Skin or drop us a line on our Twitter account at beneath underscore your. And uh, we will be happy to to let you know how the so-called pool will end up between me and Zoe. Thank you for listening and bye-bye. As always, it's a pleasure. And yeah, we're still friends. And it's, it's interesting to have a disagreement because you can work through it and then see each other's common ground and also just disagree sometimes. It's cool. But no.
It's a pleasure. And obviously you can come and say hello to me on my Let Zoe Spoil You Twitter. But for now, bye bye. <laughs> Thank you.